Hello everybody, very good morning or good afternoon or good evening based on the time zone. How are you all? Please give me a quick hands up or just uh, type in a little hi or hello when you can hear me. Okay, so welcome all of you in today's webinar. Today's webinar is all about Haroop and before we start, let me just give you a quick introduction of mine. So, my name is Anaya and I've been working as an IT professional for quite some time now and in the sphere of big data, especially Haroop, it's been my, like more than seven years that I've been working with Haroop and many other NoSQL technologies like MongoDB, many indexing services, end-to-end -end solutioning, etc, etc. So this journey has been quite uh, an amusement for me and in today's webinar, what we would try is we would try to explore this world of Haroop and see how it provides solutions to big data problems, what these problems are and what kind of things that we need to do to understand these problems and figure out a solution for them and actually implement a solution. I would also try to, we would definitely cover one use case wherein I will try to give you some kind of hands-on do some queries, set up some system, something like that, so that it doesn't get too boring and we all can understand what exactly are we talking about. So all set. Actually, before I actually start, I would like to understand just a quick one minute if uh, anybody of you already have some kind of Hadoop experience, any technology in the ecosystem, anything like that, so that it helps me understand the audience. No? Nobody has had any kind of Hadoop experience? No problem. That's why we are here, right? Okay, so as per the agenda, we will cover following aspects today. Uh, we will see what these traditional systems are and what is the model of pro data processing according to the traditional systems. Then why these systems are not capable of solving these problems and why they are not sufficient enough to solve big data problems. What exactly are we talking about when we say big data problems, big data ecosystem? How Haroop comes into picture and what Haroop does to solve this? What is it? Various components of Haroop ecosystem. And finally, we will do a quick session to understand, to do some hands-on and to do a case study on it. Okay, all set? So give me a quick heads up when you are ready and I can proceed further. Okay, perfect. So what are these traditional systems? Before I actually go on to the actual topic, let me just stop for one last minute. And uh, there what I want to do is I want to just let you know how we will be covering these topics. So the way we will be covering this, we will start discussing some topics and anytime you have any questions, feel free to type in those questions in the question box or the chat box. And I will be trying to cover those questions as part of this that discussion itself. So when the discussion ends, we'll, I'll take up the questions. Anytime any questions are left, we will discuss them at the end of our session so that we do not disrupt the whole of the class. And that's how we will proceed further. Okay, so this is what a typical use case, a typical problem statement in today's world looks like. Okay, so let's try and understand it one by one. So we have some data, a lot of data which is coming from a lot of other, a lot of instruments or a lot of uh, file systems or databases, etc. So there can be various modes of that data. The data is coming in various forms. It is collected by some kind of collection engine or some kind of custom code or some streaming API, something like that. And once that is collected, it is stored on the grid. Okay, so this data till now we are only dealing about raw data. We have not done any kind of processing, any kind of handling with that data. Once we have restored that data, the next step obviously is to compute that data. Do some kind of ETL, some kind of processing, some kind of cleaning on that particular amount of data. When we are finished with it, the next step would be to store the final aggregated process data onto some RDBMS systems or as per need, if not RDBMS, then other systems. But basically, storing that aggregated data into some databases so that 
we can achieve the final objective. And what is the final objective? To create some application, to create some data models, etc., etc. So this is a typical use case that we have taken up. And just for the sake of simplicity, we have taken up the examples of the Sears use case, which is like which became very famous because they were they adopted Hadoop and they changed their lives by adopting Hadoop. So there they had the same use case wherein they collected data, stored data, processed it, then stored the aggregated data into some IDBM systems, and then they created some kind of reports and applications out of it. Very simple. But the catch is, when you do this kind of entire data processing pipeline, which says collection to processing to aggregation to presentation, then you have to be very sure about what technology you're using. And why am I saying that? Because in case of Sears, let's assume, when they were storing that data, there were certain problems associated with it. So the storage was happening in grid, and now when we start with the storage, when the data has just started accumulating, we are fine to go. We are good to go because we can store that data, and we can keep appending that data as it comes. But as the volume of the data gets increased and we move beyond the limitation of my hardware, then there comes a point wherein I start seeing a little bit of a problem. How? Because my system is not capable of handling that amount of data together. My system is not able to address the needs of increasing amount of data. System is not able to sustain the velocity and the volume that we are seeing. And what happens? We get to one solution wherein what we decide is let's not store the entire data let's only store the new data or partial data or only a part of the data so for example let's say i have around two petabytes or more than two petabytes of data i would say okay when i've processed this certain 10 terabytes or 20 terabytes of data i would not store it i would just archive it in some of the system some cold storage amazon s3 or something something like that and i would only store the latest or the active or the one portion, uh, the last 10% of the latest 10% of the data. Archive the rest 90% of the data so that I can make my disk available to store data and to process data. So what happens is we basically archive around 90% of the data and only 10% of the data is stored as an active data, as a hot storage for doing my further processing. Now, as you can see, if 90% of the data is actually archived, what do I get? I'm leading to premature data dead because the data is available, but it's not available to be used. It's archived in some storage. So I cannot do, if I decide that I do not want to publish this kind of report, but I have to publish a different kind of report, or I have to do a different kind of analysis of my data, I am not able to do that because that data is not available anymore. The data has been archived. So if I want to use it, I will have to re-put that data, move that data from my cold storage to my hot storage and again try and process it. And I'm not very sure if my current system would be able to sustain that kind of data. So there is a problem. I cannot store all the data at all the times if my data velocity and volume is too high. So as a result, what will happen? I will not be able to process the entire data. Only 10% of the data is processed at a particular amount of time. So the results or the accuracy of my results is not sufficient because it's not the entire data set. It's only part of the data set and that's also very less. So I'm not able to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Maybe I might be close to what I wanted, but the results are not 100% accurate. And that's not what we want, right? We don't want to give inaccurate results to our application or to our reports. Now, that's the thing that we talked about, the, the problem which is related to the storage. There is one more category of problem here. And what is that? When I want to process this data, even if it is just 10%, when I want to process this data, I am not able to move all this data from this grid to my compute node. 
So as per my traditional systems, every time you want to process some data, you have a compute node and you have some storage node. So you have to transfer the data from your storage to your compute and there you want to do the computation. And this activity of transferring the data or moving the data to my compute node so that I can process it is also not sustainable because it is like too much IO network IO it is like too much a load on the compute grade that I would not be able to sustain when this data grows beyond a certain limit so overall if you see I cannot store it properly I cannot process properly and I can guarantee the accuracy of my final results. Overall, I don't think this is a sustainable and an appropriate approach. So this is something which Sears witnessed and they were not able to get the results what they wanted. They invested heavily on these systems and they still could not get what they really wanted to show to their clients or to show to their heads and that's where they decided to change the approach. Okay, any questions till now? Okay, I have got one question which says, what is the difference between Harup and Splunk? Okay, so Mifta has asked this question and Mifta, Harup and Splunk are completely two different technologies. They work on two different paradigms. We will discuss, I will let you know about this at the end of the session. After we have finished the discussion about Haroop, I would give you an overview of what is Splunk and we can discuss about the differences. Okay? Okay, so let's move on to a second case study. So what we've done here is we have got a second case study for you, which is a Haroop cave study of the orbits worldwide. So orbits provide an e-commerce platform, which is like um, a platform for hotel and flight searching and all, wherein you can search for hotels, provide the ratings, etc., etc. So every day, the amount of data that they were collecting every day, they were like they had more than 1.5 million search hits, more than a million hotel searches. So people were continuously searching for flights and continuously searching for. Uh, hotel information on their website. As a result of which, they collected around 500 gigabytes of logs per day. Not only the actual rating, I'm not talking about the ratings, I'm not talking about the actual data that get, got generated in the systems, only the log files that were generated were 500 gigabytes. And you know what, these log files are very, very important because these log files contain information about session of a particular user, what the user rated, and which hotel that user searched and scanned for, all the kind of searches that happened, all the kind of session information about a particular visitor were recorded in these log files. And they were very important to analyze and understand a complete picture of the usage of the platform. So when they decided to use or trap the information that was uh, hidden inside this log files and all other databases that they, all the other information that were there in the databases they when they were using the traditional systems and their data warehouse in the traditional was there in the traditional IBMS system and they were not able to sustain this increasing load of 500 gigabytes of logs every day more than I think uh, some other hundreds of gigabytes in the database files they were not able to sustain that they were not able to process all that information so that's the reason they also decided to move from their traditional systems to Hadoop system. So overall, when we are looking at these various transitions, wherein people, wherein platforms have decided to move from the traditional technologies to the Hadoop ecosystem, the only reason, or I would not say the only reason, but one of the major driving reason here would be the volume of the data, would be the speed at which the data is growing, the velocity of the data. So this is what the problem is. This is where the, there, there is a difference between non-Hadoop and Hadoop technologies. And this is what drives adoption of Hadoop technology. There was, as you can see, a need of something different, something which was scalable, something which was sustainable, and something which could solve the problem. Now let's see how this data gets generated. We've been talking about big data. We've been talking about huge volumes of data. So let's first see, before we go into Hadoop, let's see what, how this data is getting generated. So this is just a very simple snapshot of, of what amount of data we are generating. 
we are heavily heavily using social media platforms these days so if you see this is just like you know five to six platforms listed here but in the world we have many more of these social media platforms we have we on this there here we have tried to consolidate a few of them wherein we see that we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Twitter, we have Reddit, in the world we have Vimeo, we have whatnot. So your point is, every minute of the day, so many people around the world are posting. They're posting texts, they're posting pictures, they're posting videos, they're uploading videos on YouTube, they are doing a lot of a lot of other their their media like social media channels like news channels etc etc so we are doing so much contribution in this social media world that the amount of data that we are generating every minute every second is too vast to handle by one single system so this is just like one example then the second example we can see is IOT these days IoT, Internet over things, is like a very uh, buzzword. So right from the start of your day, like right from the start when your uh, mobile phone or when your alarm clock hits your time and wakes you up, till the time in the night when you switch off your lights and go to bed, everything that you're doing, you're using geezers, you're using warm up, I mean, you're using smartphones, you're using vehicles to travel from one place to another, then you might be using... Uh, gas pumps, or patrol pumps, you're using bikes, parking meters, cameras, you have, uh, the buildings you get in, there you have sensors, there you have, uh, you know, uh, when you enter into your office, you have some kind of uh, biometric or some kind of punching device. Everything, every walk of life, everything that you do is actually creating data. These IoT sensors are creating data, they are tracking data and trapping the data and dumping the data somewhere. And then earlier, this data was not being used. This was just like we thought it's just actually not so long back. All this data was that we collected in these logs, etc., was left useless. It was discarded or it was archived. But now we know that this data is not waste, it's very valuable because it contains a lot of information. Let's just talk about a simple log data that we collect. So, for example, you go into a website or you search for apparels and you want to buy something, but you have not yet bought. You're just searching and searching and searching. So, when you're searching that data and your log is collecting that information, every hit that you do, every search that you type in, the log files are collecting all that data. And how is that data important? Because those log files can tell us about your you as a person. They can tell you about your behavior, about your likings, about the trends. They can tell you what you are interested in. If we can build some kind of model and build some kind of understanding and automate that kind of modeling, we can understand what you're doing. That's what I think the recommendation engines are doing these days. So I think it would not be a very untouched example if I say, um, when you go into Facebook or any shopping website, uh, Mintra, Jabon, or Amazon, eBay, anything, when you shop there, when you're searching for a product, you would see there is a window, there's a tab actually, on the bottom of your searches, which says you might be interested in. So how many of you have seen that tab? How many of you have actually seen it, that you get options and recommendations? And how many of you have actually clicked on one of these recommendations to see it? And they might have suited your needs. Anybody? Okay, Sebastian says he's done it. That's nice. So that's what I wanted to say is the power of processing that amount of data. If we just do not process it, we will really not be able to utilize that power. We will not be able to trap the information inside that humongous amount of data. So because of all these needs, because of all these different paradigms, big data came into existence. Okay? So I've been talking a lot about big data, big data, big data. I think nobody asked me a question, what is big data? So I keep it an open with you. So what is big data to you, to you people? What is big data? What do you understand about big data? Any ideas? Okay, Sebastian says huge data. Yeah, that's one aspect. What else? Difficult to process, definitely. Anybody? Any thoughts? 
No? Okay. So, big data, obviously, humongous amounts of data, which have certain properties associated with it. And what it is? This data is huge in volume. It grows at a very high rate. It has a lot of variety, as in it has, it can be of different types. Uh, it can be audio, it can be video, it can be text, it can be structured like a database data. It can be a lot of other types of data. Because of all these, it's really complex. And since it is complex, it is really difficult to handle and process this amount of data. So big data is, is a term for the collection of that huge and complex data, which is very difficult to process and use it. And because of that, the traditional systems have not been able to process that data. That's why it evolved as a complete different paradigm. And there are a complete different set of technologies to address these problems. This is not just a, you know, any, any, amount, any, any large amount of data cannot be termed as big data. I would say that it is a space which comprises of a set of problem statements which are associated with large amount of data and complex data and uh, difficult processing and velocity of data, etc., etc. So I think what I say is IBM tried to define this big data in terms of a definition. And that is one definition I really love. So what IBM tried to define was big data comprises of three Vs. And what these three Vs are, velocity at which the data grows, volume of the data, and variety of the data. So these three Vs define a big data. Okay? So obviously, now when we are talking about all these properties, obviously there are some problems associated with it. Because if there were no problems, if it was very good and jolly, there was no need of creating a different sphere or different set of technologies to solve them. So let's see, what are the problems? Can somebody tell me, actually the definition itself contains the answers. So can you try and unfold this definition and give me what problems do you see when we are talking about big data? So, the first problem that we've been discussing and discussing is storage. The data is huge and it's exponentially growing. It's not that if I know that I have like, you know, two petabytes or two petabytes or ten petabytes of data that I have to handle, I'm still okay with the traditional system. I can still figure out and find out some way in which I can manage it. But when I know that it's 10, 2 petabytes today and it's going to be 3 petabytes the next year or maybe, uh, you know, maybe every day or every a month I'm going to add gigabytes and terabytes and zettabytes of the data into my system, it is something which goes beyond my reach. So it's like fitting an elephant into a refrigerator problem. So when I try to solve this kind of or process this data or use traditional systems for this kind of data, I really cannot, I'm not able, I will not be able to do that. So as per the predictions that have been done, you can see that by 2020, if we grow to 44 zettabytes of data, honestly, I, at the top of my head, I cannot even figure out how many zeros are there in zettabytes. So it's like humongous. We're talking about huge volumes of data. Every day we are adding data to, to our systems. It can be any system in the world. We are adding data to Facebook. We are doing a lot of uh, social media. We are doing a lot of sensor devices in our home, in our office, from our parking lots to our cars. Everything, everything is about data these days. If you cannot utilize it, you will be lagging behind. So there is a race rat race going on to utilize the data and to bring up some meaningful information from that data which somebody else might not have been able to do. It. So we are witnessing a big problem here. The second problem is processing it. It can have a lot of variety. So based on that, what we have tried to do, uh, the entire landscape of data has been actually categorized into three different types. And one of them, the three types are structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. So structured data, as it really makes sense, and as you can easily figure out from the picture itself, it has a pretty good format. 
it has a format which it follows like for example the data that we have in our database it has a structure because we have a set defined format we have columns and we have the names of those columns and the rows always have to adhere to this schema of these columns so it has a structure it is very organized the second set which moves a little ahead from the structured data is our semi-structured data wherein we can have information which is structured which has a format which has a schema along with that we also have data which does not have structure for example JSON files, XML files. So JSON, for example, in JSON files, I obviously have column names, and that's what we use keys to denote. So I have keys and values. So my one JSON document will have some keys and some values. But necessarily, not it's not necessarily that even my second JSON document will also have the same keys and the same that I had in the previous document. These key values can vary. If I have an XML document, one XML document can have certain set of fields and the same second document in the same XML will can have more than that fields. It can have one extra field or one less field or something like that. So here we are talking about the difference in the schema. And not only that, this is just the difference in the schema. Along with the difference in the schema, I am also able to type in a lot of textual information in the JSON files I can have image files I, for example when we talk about databases like MongoDB which completely work on JSON like formats you can have um, audio files you can have videos you can have any kind of XYZ text information any kind of information which you never had or which you cannot save in your structured format so you have a semi structured kind of data then we are talking about the third paradigm, which is a little ahead from all of these, which is completely unstructured. The data has no structure at all, only video. So if you have to store and process videos. So I think a few years back, I worked on one of the projects wherein we had one organization that came to us and the requirement was pretty simple. They had some device, some media device that helped them display and play with uh, videos and audios and movie files and all that and the idea was when somebody was playing or watching a video on their app they can use that app on a Mac on your laptop or any other lap Windows laptop or you can have that app on your smartphones or your desktops or anything like that so one particular user ID can have multiple devices the app downloaded on multiple devices and let's assume I'm in my car and watching a movie on small TV that I have inside my car and once I get home I just want to watch that movie on my TV and let's say when I've gotten to bed I want to continue watching the same movie on my smartphone so when I'm doing these transitions I want that movie to start playing from the very same point from which I paused it or stopped it when I transitioned from my devices so based on the profile, we had to understand from at that at what point the movie was paused and stopped and the amount of data that we were handling there was like completely, completely video data and it was humongous. It needed processing to understand and start the movie from exactly from the point to buffer that movie and start the movie from the point it started. So this was just one simple use case wherein we wanted to entrap the power that was hidden inside unstructured data. And Haruk obviously was a choice at that time. So we are not in the same old traditional space we were in 20 years back when databases or Oracle databases, SQL, Memes SQL were the hype of the world. Today we are talking about variety of the data. And we need some system which can process that variety and that process that garbage lecture and give us meaningful information. Okay? Now, Moving back to the third problem that we see, we saw that we have problem with the storage, we saw that we have problem with the velocity and the structure, or not the velocity actually, the, uh, the variety. Now the third thing, the problem with processing that data. I want to process that data fast enough because the speed at which the data is growing, it needs to be processed at the same speed. Then it would really not make sense if I can collect the data or maybe collect the data for 
10 days, 20 days, and then I would take another 10 days to process the data. Or maybe um, today the data I collect on, let's say, the first of a month, I would take two days or three days to process and publish the evaluated results on the fourth or the sixth of the month. That would really not make sense because the speed at which the data is going, it needs to be processed with the same speed. Now there are certain aspects to this problem. Why we are not able to process that data that fast enough? One is, we are, as you would have seen when you would have been, you know, buying laptops or desktops or any machines, um, over the past 20, 25 years, this is something which I have seen, earlier we used to, you know, get buy laptops which had like 512 megabytes of disk space or 1 GB of RAM. This is some traditional laptop that I had, like, you know, 12, 13 years back. And then, Today, I can get and buy a laptop which has terabytes, uh, 20 terabytes of disk space, but the RAM that I still get is like maximum I can get 4 GB or 8 GB of RAM. I'm talking about a laptop. So if you can see here, the transition that we have made, we have increased the hard disk capacity a lot over these periods, over these years. But the processing part or the RAM, I mean, the entire space of, uh, space of that processing and disk transfer rate, etc., we have not been able to cope up with that increased volume of data that we are looking at. So I can store that data, but my disk is not able to read and write that data fast enough. So if I store one terabytes of data on a system and I'm not able to process the data, terabytes of data in a minute, then what is the point? I will never be able to take advantage of that data. I will be taking, you know, hours to process the data. And this is not something which I want. This is like one side of the problem. Then there is another side of the problem. Even the traditional systems advanced. It's not that the traditional systems were like, you know, using the same agenda. They were not, they were using one system and they used to scale that system horizontally. No. Earlier they were scaling vertically and the traditional systems also, uh, they had a leap and there also there was a, a, f a phenomenon of scaling horizontally. So they also decided on a, a horizontal scaling where they had different nodes and different uh, architecture. So this here, the second image here highlights what the traditional system advanced to, to solve this problem. We had a problem that one system could not suffice the transfer rates. So the objective was, okay, if one system cannot suffice us, let have multiple systems. Then we had multiple systems, then we had a master-slave kind of an architecture. But here, the problem was, you, you distributed the data. So you have you know, uh, only partial data on each machine. But whenever you wanted to process the data, this entire data, let's say I want to process some data and part of which data lies on slave A and slave B. And when I want to process it, I have to move that data to my master node where my processing logic lies, like that, and then I want to process the data. So here, the computation unit, my master, which is my computation unit, is a bottleneck because it will also not have that amount of processing power. So I can read the data pretty fast because I've decreased the volume of data that has to be read at a moment of time, but I'm not able to process that. I do not have enough capacity to process that data. First of all, I'm limited by the I.O., but I.O. is still you can manage. Then I'm limited by the processing power and computation power of my system. Okay? So they were like, problems and problems going on. There, there was like no stopping of these problems. So there was a leap in developing distributed file systems. Okay, so before I go on to distributed file systems, let me know if you have any questions. Whatever we've discussed so far about big data, about the problems that we have with big data, any questions till now? Okay, so I have one question. What do you mean by horizontal scaling? Does it refer to scale out? Yes, horizontal scaling is scaling out. So 
vertical scaling is adding hardware to the same machine. So I have one machine and I just want, I'm just increasing the, the RAM and the, maybe the processing units or something like that on the same machine. But there's always a limit to it. I can never, how much I feel an ant, I, an ant can never become an elephant, right? So I cannot scale beyond a certain limit. So what is the need? Well, the need is I have more than one machines, right? So when I have more than one machines, they actually, we scale horizontally and we increase the power of the entire system overall rather than increasing the power of one system. So Sebastian is saying, what about the cost aspect when one scale up as compared to scale out? This is a very interesting question actually, Sebastian. When we scale out, uh, these systems that provide you the capability of scaling out, first of all, most of these systems support running on commodity hardware. By commodity hardware, I certainly do not mean that I, I'm not talking about laptops or desktops. I'm talking about commodity servers. Some, uh, when we scale up, first of all, there will be a limit. And second of all, when I have to buy heavier and heavier machines or heavier and heavier servers, I invest a lot of money. Rather than if I invest the same amount of money, when I scale out or when I grow horizontally, I will get better power and better capacity on my machines. So from investments perspective, from the cost perspective, scaling out is a better option also. Because for the same amount, for the same investment, I get better results. Does that answer your question? We do not have to spend the same amount of money in, you know, buying the same level of hardware for all the machines in my cluster. I can have smaller machines or maybe a lesser hardware, commodity hardware, and I can scale out very well. So in long term, definitely, definitely scaling out is a cost effective option because in scaling out, we have one very good advantage. We can utilize the information that we have of, about our data because I know when my peak periods would be. So let's say I know that at, I have some e-commerce platform and I will be, um, uh, I will be having heavy load in Christmas time. I can add more machines whenever needed in my cluster and I can have a better capacity of my cluster and I know that people are on break when exams are going on or when, um, when maybe two months later in February or March then I would you know I would decrease the capacity scale down and then I can have better uh, utilization of my money and my notes so it's definitely in long term a cost effective option okay any other questions no? So can we move on? Are you ready to explore the world of Hadoop one by one? So I'm going to unfold the pages. I'm going to touch base upon the various foundation systems or foundation um, terms or technologies and then we're going to move with the actual Hadoop system. Okay? All set? Okay, anytime you have any questions, just feel free, type in that, those questions and once I have some breather or after we complete a particular topic of discussion, we can take up those questions and answer them. Okay, so we have been talking about scaling out. We've been talking about setting up distributed systems. So what is a distributed file system? So if you see here, it's a very interesting difference that has been pointed out. If you see here, before we had distributed file systems, we managed one particular abstraction in one kind of system. So let's say I have four types of information and four different categories of information. I have some information around finance and accounts and customers, reports, all of that. So since obviously we have moved forward from our scaling up option because we are not able to scale anymore vertically, so obviously the next option is to scale out. And to do that, what we decided as per uh, the second advance in the traditional systems, what happened? They decided, okay, if that's not possible, scaling, uh, if vertical growing is not possible, let's grow horizontally. Let's divide this information into certain portions. So I will have 
categories of this information. My, so each of my server will be handling one set of one category of this information. So let's say my server one will be handling accounts, my server two will be handling finance related things, server three customer, server four reports, so on and so forth. Now, the problem is my application has to know and understand which information has to go where explicitly at which information is to be read from what phase. All this information, you know, all this kind of metadata and all this kind of maintenance activities have to be a part of your application also, which is not a very good idea. I'm an I have an application. My application doesn't need to worry about where the data is being stored, how the data is being stored, and how the data is being read. My application is only supposed to worry about how am I going to utilize that data, process that data, and get information from that data. I'm, I should not be worried about where to store and where to read from and all of these things because that becomes really, really unmanageable. My application layer is so tightly integrated with all of these maintenance activities. The second problem I see here is when one of these nodes goes down, let's say if server one has got down, there is no way, there's no way, you know, to utilize all the existing machines, three servers that we still have and still not have a downtime. We will still have downtime because my server one is gone. We do not have any other way to till somebody gets in into the server room sees what the problem is, maybe there was an electricity cut or maybe there was some short circuit and fix the problem and get the server one live again. Till that period, maybe an hour or two, till that period I have a downtime. And maybe my application is not made to have downtime. I do not want, if, if something like this happens in Christmas time, I lose business. This is what I do not want. So, there evolved DFS, Distributed File Systems, wherein all these servers, all these four servers were connected to each other to form a common cluster. All of these servers have information, know about, they consolidate all of these four different categories of information and store them under one cluster identity rather than one server level identity. So this information is now no longer split at the cluster level. It's only split at the cluster level. Um, it's not split at the machine or the server level. This information now has an identity or has a namespace at an entire cluster level. And I can utilize all of these four machines for anything. So if they have these distributed file systems provide you with an abstraction layer, they provide you with a capability of fault tolerance by incorporating features like redundancy, etc. And whenever whenever something goes down, let's say the server has gone down, now I'm able to still connect to these three machines. And most of the times, DFS has redundancy capabilities. So the amount of data that's lying here somewhere will also be lying here somewhere or maybe here somewhere. So I'll have some redundant copies and I will be still be able to use this information and I don't have to wait for two hours till my support team gets in into the server room and gets the system live again. Okay, so the, and all of these things, you know, storage of information, which node, which machine has what information, uh, where is the copies located, how to access it, how, what node will be used to access it, what node will be used to write more information, all of that information, all of that maintenance activities and administration activities are separated from your application and these frameworks which work on distributed systems and one of these frameworks is Hadoop which works on these distributed systems take that load from you and they take care of all these things internally. You don't, your application doesn't need to bother about all that. Okay? Okay. Let me move on to the next slide and then we can take up your questions. Okay? So why DFS? It's just the second part of the same problem. So let's assume I have one machine and that machine has four IO channels. 
each channel has a capacity of reading, let's say, 100 megabytes of data per second. Now, if I have to read one terabyte of data, which is stored in this machine, what time does it take? It takes around 43 minutes. And I have, uh, you can compute it yourself. I have computed it myself. So how does it happen is, it has like, for example, just to show you a simple computation, if I have one terabyte of data, I'm talking about 1024 cross 1024 megabytes of data. And I can only read 100 megabytes in one second. So, and I have four such IO channels. And when I convert it into minutes, I get around 43.6 minutes. So this is how we compute that if we have one machine which has four channels, each channel has a reading capacity of 100 megabytes per second, then I can read this information in 43 minutes. Now imagine, you want to process that data, one terabyte, you can just read the data in 43 minutes, then plus you have to do some kind of processing, and then again you have to do some writing in the data to process the final results, and then your application can use these final results to be displayed on the screen or maybe generate reports or whatever. So this, at least at a minimum, takes out of time, which is not very good, which is not something I'm pretty happy about. So what I do is, instead, if I have 10 machines like that, which are joined in parallel with each other, and each machine has four IO channels, and each channel has 100 MBPS per second, then obviously I would take 4.3 minutes to process this data. Maximum with processing time, reading time, processing time, dumping time, and final reporting, I would max take 10 minutes, which is like not too huge. So this is, this is manageable. So this is the power of having distributions. This is the power of having parallelism, obvious, which is pretty obvious, right? I can have uh, one machine doing something, and I can have 10 machines doing the same work, task. So if the task is distributable, if I can really distribute it, then I would say DFS can solve your problems a lot. OK? So before I get on to Hadoop, actually let us have some round of questions let me know any questions that you have till now so Sebastian says how will I get to know about which data is stored on which machine nice question actually all of this information is there it's stored as in metadata so you can use that metadata information and the framework is capable of using that metadata information to understand which data is stored on which machine and you don't have to worry about it because the framework is going to take care of it. The only thing you have to do is you have to say, okay, I want to read this file. The framework will understand where these files, where the information for this file is, which all nodes contain this information, and it will select a node for you, and then you can read from it. Uh, Mayank says, so DFS would have storage overhead. I'm not exactly able to understand what you mean by storage overhead, Mayank. Are you talking about replication? Okay, if I understand it right, from the storage point of view, from the writing point of view, uh, DFS has certain features as in it. One is, one of course, is the replication factor. So it, most of the times, distributed systems maintain replication so that they can give you fault tolerance. So obviously you have to write larger amount of data than the actual data because you have to maintain copies. So this is one advantage that you get, but every advantage, right, you get at a cost. So you are getting fault tolerance, but you have to manage with the slightly greater amount of time while you're writing the data. That's why we need some form of DFS which can manage all these kind of issues and which can work around all these kind of problems. And that's what we are coming to in the next slides. So Hadoop comes to the rescue. All of these things, I want, I have distributed systems, I'm using commodity hardware, so the chances of my nodes failing, and nodes fail all the time, are higher. So I have to manage with this failure. I have to have a way wherein I can have some kind of fault tolerance. Then as Mayang just pointed out, we are writing more amount of data, 
and since we are writing it in a distributed manner, it has some kind of way, a definite pattern in which I have to manage with all that writing. Right? So Hadoop is a rescue to us. Hadoop is a framework which does all that. It is a framework which allows us to store that data in the distributed manner, in a completely distributed fashion, and process that data also in distributed fashion. You remember the picture that we saw earlier when we had um, multiple nodes where we distributed the data and then we had this master and every time I want to process that I had to move this information to my master and I was limited by the computation power of my master and I was not processing the data here in parallel actually not completely parallel right so Hadoop changes this paradigm it changes the way these distributed systems were working earlier and I will show you how in a few minutes okay so overall Hadoop is a framework that works on the same master slave format it has a master and it has a slave more than one slave actually and all of these activities of storage and processing are divided into two separate components and one of the components is HDFS, which manages the storage part. You can dump anything, any amount. Your system should have enough. And in the entire cluster, the total capacity of your cluster should be able to suffice that. And if you still are running out of capacity, you can add more machines as your data grows. So HDFS manages all this kind of writing and reading of data, everything related to storage. And then we have MapReduce. MapReduce is the second important component of Hadoop, which takes care of the processing tasks. So here we store, and we store in a distributed manner, and here we compute. And in computation, we do 100% parallel computation. No more limitation by the master computation unit, 100% parallel computation. So here, if you see, the data is processed completely in parallel, not like this. So what will happen here? These are my slave nodes. So these have, let's say, some data. And this is my master. The only job of master is to have metadata. So master contains all the metadata that we've been talking about. Which node, which file, which machine, where are the duplicates, what are the writes, everything is there with the master. And the slaves contain the actual data. So here we say the master is named as name node, and the slaves are named as data nodes. And the slaves actually contain the data. Okay? And when we talk about computation, we are not here in the old paradigm, we were moving the data to the code. Right? So we have the code there on a master, and we were moving the data to the code. But here it's reverse. We move the code to the data. So moving the data to the code, let's say even if, let's say I have one terabyte of data, and I have 10 machines in my traditional systems. Okay, then I have to process the data in my traditional DFS system, even if I have 10 terabytes, one terabyte, and I have 10 machines, so logically each machine has like 100 gigabytes of data, or oh, the information, when I want to process this one terabyte, every time over the network, I will have to transfer one gigabyte of data from each machine, a total of one terabyte. It's like huge, right? Huge network I.O. But here it's not like that. Once I have saved that information, once I have saved 100 gigabytes on each of these 10 nodes, I will move my code to this data, so, which is like in KBs, right? my actual code, my actual processing logic is like in KBs of file, it's some jar file or some uh, Python script or some shell script which is like in KBs, hardly in megabytes. So the amount of I.O. that I'm seeing here is drastically reduced. But the only thing is once that is done I can consolidate my results and final results I can still save here. here. In these nodes and whenever I want to read my final results then these 
framework will take care of using this metadata, finding out, figuring out where are the results, and then giving to the user. So you have full-fledged parallelism working here. Okay? Okay, so I hope everybody is clear what is Zeroop. So I've got a request from Sebastian, actually. He wants me to go a little bit faster. I would like to know a little bit um, uh, from you all guys. Do you want me to increase the speed of this? Till now, I've been taking a lot more time to discuss about each topic so that I can make you understand why we need Hadoop. And now, since we have gotten into Hadoop, it's, it's on you. Let me know how do you want to uh, take it. Okay. So um, people want me to get, take a little fast. No problems. We can do that. Okay, so we had some problems that we had been continuously seeing and some problems that we listed when we were seeing why traditional systems are not able to solve this. So let's see how Hadoop solves that. Okay, so problem number one, the data was too huge and I cannot ex store this exponentially growing data. Now, how Hadoop solves this problem? Hadoop solves this problem by First of all, saving that data in a distributed fashion. So I have a master and I have slaves. So I will save that data in a distributed fashion. And how I will do that? We will divide that data into blocks or into smaller chunks and distribute each chunk on one of these nodes. So let's assume I have 512 MBs of file. As per the default settings in Hadoop, the default block size or chunk size is 128 MB. So I will have four blocks for this particular file, each of 128 MB, and these can be stored on these different nodes. And let's say I have a bigger file, I can again divide it and store that along with it. As in when I have larger and larger amount of data and my disk is running out, I can have more nodes coming in, joining in, and I can store the data. So storage is solved. Let's see what next, okay? So next is, storing the complex data, that is unstructured data. And honestly, Hadoop is not a database. Hadoop is a file system. So you can store anything, any kind of data. You can store audio, video, you can store text file, you can store even database files, you can store anything. So it doesn't allow you to store only a particular schematic, a schematic data. You can store semi-structured or unstructured data. And then you write data inside Hadoop. Even the components of Hadoop, I mean, like Hive and HDF, uh, uh, like Hive, there's no schema validation when you dump data. The only thing that your application needs to take care of when you're reading data, then you have to understand what data is there. Otherwise, till that point, you don't have to worry about what data are you writing in. So second problem resolved. Third problem, processing that data fast enough. So we already saw, right? Here, in the traditional systems, we are always moving our file or our data to our master node. So we are limited by the computation power of my master node. So we saw that when we had one terabyte of data that was to be processed or read by one machine, or we took 43 minutes. But now here, this is complete parallelism. We are moving the code to the data. So here, each machine has to handle it. So here, if I'm saying one terabyte of file needs to process, one by one, that one terabyte needs to, of file needs to be moved to my master and I need to process it there. But here, only portion of that data needs to get processed and that too on the processing on the data node. I don't have to move that data to my master node to process it. So the processing is completely parallel and much faster. So Hadoop is completely rescuing you because it's giving you a solution to all of your problems that you had in your traditional systems. Okay? So what are the competence of Hadoop? We saw Hadoop had two different paradigms. One was storage and one was processing. Storage is, was handled by HDFS components and processing was done by M MapReduce. In today, we, in the latest version, we have the second version of MapReduce, which is called MRV2, and entire processing paradigm is handled by YAN. YAN is resource managing engine. It allows you to manage your resources based on the type of processing that you want to do, and do that entire processing power, processing for you in parallel on the HDFS system. 
So we have two components, HDFS, storage, and YAN for processing. And both of these components operate in a master-slave fashion. For storage, I already told you, we have master and slave, where the master is called the name node, and the slave is called the data node. Similarly, even in YAN, for processing, we have master-slave architecture. We have a master process, which is called a resource manager, and this resource manager acts like a master for you. And then we have on each of these data nodes, we have a process which is called as a node manager. And this node manager manages the resources which are available on that particular data node. And these four components together comprise of the core Hadoop power. Okay? So let's see these one by one. First of all, the HDFS components. This is something I've, we've discussed in the last four slides as well. Master component, which is called as a name node. And we have a lot of slave components, which are called as a data nodes. So the data nodes contain the actual data. There you need storage, because you're actually talking about storing the data in these data nodes. And name node only contains the metadata of this data. As in, what are the permissions associated with reading that file? Which users can read and write those files? Where are these blocks, when we, let's say one file has four blocks, so which nodes contain those blocks? Where are the copies of these blocks? And name node also gets repeated heartbeats or you know pings from these data nodes so that it knows that, okay, if I have four data nodes in my cluster and one name node, the name node at continuous intervals of time are going to get heartbeats from these data nodes to understand if any of the data node has gone down or is not available. If something is not available, all of the data, all of the processing that was happening on that data needs to be moved to some other system so that you have completely false tolerance system and you have to maintain replication power. So that's why you have this kind of architecture, master-slave architecture, in which your data nodes are continuously interacting and giving their block report from them to the name node. And when we're talking about the actual client reading and writing, we will see how these all communicate with each other to write and read data. Okay? Then, this is what an overall architecture looks like. So you have a name node and you have multiple name nodes. You have various two kind of racks in which your data nodes are distributed. So as I said, the data nodes contain the actual data. So this is this what you see here. This is the actual data. And the name node contains only the metadata. So whenever you want to do some kind of block operation, then you would want to, the name node would interact with the data nodes. And when you want the client to do some kind of reading or writing activity, then obviously for the metadata operations to figure out if I have permissions to read the file or not, where are the data nodes, uh, nodes located, where are the blocks located, uh, the client will do all the metadata operations by connecting to the name node. And the actual read or the actual write will happen by client communicating directly with these data nodes. So this is the overall architecture of HDFS. Any questions till this point? So Sebastian is saying, what do you mean by metadata operations? So metadata operation means all the operations related to the metadata. So when I want to write something, or when I want to write a new file, or when I want to read a file, I would really, uh, my system will have to check if, my, if the user has permissions to write that file or not. If the user, where these, the, the blocks of these files are located, all of these activities which uh, revolve around the metadata uh, are considered as metadata operations. Okay? So, what are these blocks? So as I told you, the default size of a block in HDFS is 128 MB. Earlier it was 64, but now in the latest version it is 128 MB. So when I have a file of let's say 248 MB, obviously based on the size, it's divided into two blocks. The block 1 is 128 MB and block 2 is the remaining of it, 120 MB. So every block is at max of 128 MB. I cannot go beyond of that. 
but obviously if the last block the information that is left for the last block is lesser then I would have only that amount of space available so let's assume I have a total file size of 514 MB then how many blocks will I have I will have five blocks four blocks which will be 128 MB and the last block this compare this makes 512 and I have two MBs of information left which will be the part of my fifth block okay any confusions here about the block size if you're good to go just give me a quick hands up so that I know that you are understanding and you're with me okay perfect okay now there's an important very important logic that that we have when we are dealing with Hadoop architecture Hadoop is rack aware what do you mean by rack aware so when we are talking about a cluster the data nodes some of the data nodes fall in one rack and some of the data nodes fall in one, another rack and this is the normal network topology that we maintain when we are talking about a Hadoop cluster I'm not talking about a cluster of just two or three machines I'm actually talking about a cluster a bigger cluster which comprises of tens of 20s and more more of that so here you have your data nodes are distributed in certain racks and let's assume in this particular case we have three racks and we have four nodes in each of these three racks so when I'm writing data when Hadoop is writing data let's say I have three blocks a B C and I want to write data in these blocks so what will happen here is that when I'm writing data then my architecture or my framework actually will be aware of what these racks are which which uh, data node falls in which rack and by rack I hope you all know about racks by rack I only mean the nodes which come under the same network switch so I have let's say three nodes falling under one switch they form the one, form one rack then I have three nodes falling under another switch or another network uh, same network uh, switch they become another rack and then these two will be combined will be obviously connected by some switch to, so that it becomes a common art, common cluster and that's how they have all of these nodes in the same rack in jo uh, have are shared by the same network uh, bandwidth okay and so what will what will happen here is that when I'm let's say I'm writing block A Haru will the framework will get the rack IDs from these data nodes and it will create a rack topology something like this saying that rack 1 has this rack 2 has this rack 3 has this then it will keep one copy of this node on one rack on any data node on one rack and then two copies of that node on two data nodes of another rack so this is a manner in which it keeps writing it. This is a default manner in which it, ideal manner actually, in which it writes it, until and unless your capacity is full or your nodes don't have the hard disk. This is the ideal way in which it does that. And why? Reason number one, when you are doing it, when you are writing information, whenever you are writing information here, if I keep the third copy in the third rack here and not here, then here there is a bandwidth that I can utilize the network IO that I can uh, that I have to do is cross racks so this is going to take uh, more time to transfer racks from one switch to another but same would happen here but instead if I'm writing a second copy here then it will be within the rack and it will be faster enough than writing a third copy there okay so by default Hadoop maintains three copies and one copy is in rack one node one of rack one and the two copies are in two nodes of rack two so one advantage that we get here is we we save some time while I'm writing data so that because when I'm writing inside the same rack I have better network uh, with me and I have less latency okay second advantage that I get here if I'm keeping all the copies in the same rack and if my rack goes down the entire switch goes down with something fall that some uh, network split has happened and I'm not able to contact the entire node I will lose everything 
I will lose all the three copies. I will not be able to recover from that fault. So that's why we choose multiple rights to write our data. And why we do not we keep the second copy in the same rack so that we can have faster writing. So these are some advantages by which I can write fast data fast enough. And these are the some ways in which Hadoop writes data. So let's try and solve some uh, this rack algorithm, and then we will take up your questions. Okay. So let's see this. Now block one, the first copy, data node one. The second copies will be on data node 6 and data node 8. Fair enough? Now it's for you to answer. If my first copy of block B is on data node 7, logically, where do you see the two other copies lie? It will be on rack 3, some two nodes of rack 3. Then, similarly, the third block, at rack 3, data node 11, and the two copies on rack 1. So the data distribution is equally fairly balanced and it is rack aware so that I can have fault tolerant capabilities in my system. Okay? So before I go into the details, I have a few questions that I would like to take up and then I can deal or I can tell you about the HDFS read and write mechanisms. So Saket is asking, uh, saving three copies in racks will increase the memory? Uh, no, it has nothing to do with uh, the memory actually. Saving the three copies in the three racks will only give you, um, in these racks will only give you fault tolerant mechanism. And Mayank is asking, what will happen if we have four to five replicas? If I have four to five replicas, similar thing will happen. I will have the fourth copy uh, on the third rack and then the fifth copy may be on the second data node of the third rack and so on and so forth. So I will move in that fashion, two, two copies on this uh, one node and the third copy on the other node. I will move like that. So um, Sebastian is asking what about the storage issue since we are making copies. There are no storage issues actually. Only thing is we have to uh, provision our hardware to have three times uh, the space, uh, three times the capacity. Uh, I mean, uh, let's say my data is like one petabyte, so my system should have at least three petabytes of space available. So I will have to uh, provision that amount of space and, or, and the uh, copying of that data and the copying the data in parallel in all these uh, distributed systems is going to be taken care of by uh, my HDFS. And I will, after some time, once we cover this, I will show you one quick example of where, how to, how do we do simple read and write operations. So Sebastian is saying, don't you think it's costly a way to have fault tolerance? Yes. It is costly because it's fault tolerance. So everything comes with a price. As I told you, when you really want your system to be, you know, 100% live and live all the time and no downtime, you have to pay for it. So everything comes at a cost. Bob says, in case the second and the third copies are only in case of rack failures, so will it be better if the third copy is saved in rack three? So in case of rack failure, if your entire rack 2 is failing, then we, let me go back. Okay, in case of your uh, fa rack failure, if my entire rack 2 is failing, I still have one copy available on rack 1. If I have my entire rack 1 failing, I have still two copies available in rack 2. And if I have my entire two racks failing, I think that's not a very... Um, optimistic scenario that really doesn't happen too much but if your data is too too vulnerable then we can have we can rather choose for a higher replication time rather than having a default replication time default replication factor of three so i can have a replication factor of four and i can have another copy here so i will not be falling into the same trap again okay all clear okay so let's see how do we actually write data. So when we're writing data, there are actually three steps involved. Step number one, then you first decide which nodes to be used to write the data, which is called the pipeline setup. Step number two, 
actually writing the data. And step number three, acknowledging the data write, so that the client knows that the data write is complete. So these three different steps make the data writing mechanism. So let's understand step number one, the pipeline setup. So whenever, let's say you have two blocks, block A and block B that you want to write, and your client obviously interacts and gives a write request to your name node because name node is master, so the master node receives all the requests. So the client says, okay, I want to write block A, and it contacts the name node for that. The name node, based on the availability of the data nodes, it tells the client, uh, the HDFS client, that you have three these three data nodes that I have selected, and you please write this block on these three data nodes. Then the client will contact the rack switch. This is the core switch, which is like different racks, connects the different racks, and then it contacts that particular data node, data node one in the pipeline. Once that is done, the data node pipeline will try and contact the data node 4, the next in the pipeline. Because the data node 1 wants to understand if it can contact the next, next node in the pipeline or not, and if the network is healthy. So it will contact data node 4. And then data node 4 will contact data node 6 and see if that node is ready. This step is important. Why? Because these nodes also have to interact with each other to pass the blocks for the next, uh, for the copies. So they ha also have to be ready for interacting between them. If there is a problem, if let's say this is not possible, if data node 4 is not able to interact with data node 6, it is going to return and I'm not able to do that. And hence the name node will allocate a different data node, maybe data node 7, to this and then data node 4 will again try to contact data node 7 and see if it's available. So in all this if you see a sort of a pipeline is being set up so that data can be passed on for this particular block from to all these data nodes and we can maintain copies. Now once you have the pipeline ready and handy you would want to do the actual writing and as I told you the actual writing happens between the client and the data nodes. There is no name node involved now. Now the client already knows the pipeline, so the client will start writing data. For that particular block, I will first write, do a write request to the core switch, and then I will write data to block A to the first replica on data node one in my pipeline. Then once this is done, in a, there will be another request which will be give, sent to data node 4 to write the data in block in data node 4. Data node 4 will send another write request to data node 6 to write the third copy of that same block. And that's how the writing will happen. Now, once the writing is done, once we are done with that, I have to acknowledge that the writing has happened completely and successfully. So, what will happen in that case? In that case, the data node 6, which is the last node in the pipeline, will say and send an acknowledgement to data node 4 saying that I have copied my data and I have my data. So my process, copy one, done. Data node 4 will pass the acknowledgement to data node 1 and say that second copy that I was supposed to do and I've done it. Data node 1 now we'll acknowledge that and send acknowledgement to the core switch telling that I now have all the three copies and I've got the acknowledgement from the other nodes as well and all the three copies have been done. This acknowledgement will then be sent via the core switch to the client and the client will send an acknowledgement to the name node saying that the write is also successful and when this write is successful the metadata is updated. Any questions till now? Any questions on how do we write data? So Sebastian is saying, is it so that the client is writing the data in all the data nodes? Yes. So when the HDFS client is taking care of that, not that you have to connect to a client, to a data node explicitly. You have an HDFS client and your application connects to that HDFS client and that HDFS client takes care of 
getting the pipeline from the name node and writing the actual data inside the data nodes and then sending the acknowledgement back to the name node. So this HDFS client does all this activity for you. Your application client only has to connect to or have the driver of this HDFS client. You have to have the, this driver and you have to just send, I have this file, I want to write it. That's it. So this till now, we've been talking about writing one data, one block. Now, if I have more than one block, how does it happen? If I have more than one block, then the process is completely, completely similar. The only thing is, if I have one GB of file, then I will have, I'll be storing three GB in HDFS. Why? Because I'm creating three copies by default. And obviously, there will be three GB traffic. But mind it, all of this traffic will not be on one particular network. It will be distributed across networks because some traffic will be from data node to data node and some of this traffic will be from the client to a particular data node or switch. Okay, so let's see a simple process. This is just a recapitulation of the same. Let's say for block one, I have the pipeline wherein I'm writing the data to first the data node one. And from the data node, I write the data to data node 4, the same as I did earlier. And then from data node to data node, uh, data node 6. And then we send the acknowledgement back. There can be one more scenario, wherein we choose a rack and copy two replicas first, and then the third replica on the other rack. So let's say the second one, which is 1B, wherein I'm first moving to rack 5, and I am copying the first block, first copy on the same node on, on a node of this rack 5, data node 7. And second copy I'm maintaining the same rack. Okay, data node 9, based on the availability of space. Now, ideally, when I'm placing two copies in one rack, then the third copy has to be on the other rack. So we will send the acknowledgement back to the switch and then we move to the second switch and we keep a third copy here. So it's the same thing. It's like two ways. Maybe we can place, first we place two copies in the same node on the same rack and the third copy on the third node. Or we start from placing one copy on one replica and then the two copies on the other uh, two nodes in the second rack. So based on the which uh, direction you start with, we have the same way of, you know, of writing. Okay. Now, we've done the copies, we've stored the data. Let's see how do we really write, read it. Now, as we said, our data comprises of two blocks, block A and block B. So I need to, be, and these are the data nodes on which the data, write, uh, data is residing. So whenever the client using the driver says that I want to read the data, it will, the driver will first of all translate and go to the name node and issue a read request for these blocks of this particular data file. Once I'm doing that read request, my name node, based on the availability of these data nodes, it will tell you that, okay, you can read block A from data node 1, and we can read block 2 from data node 3. Why this is being chosen? If my node is available, we would want to read the data from the same rack only, rather than reading the data from two different racks, so that it, the process is fast enough. If my data node 3 is busy, I would then, uh, the name node can rather, choosing the data node 3 for block B, it can choose data node 7. That just depends on the availability of your data node. So, the client says, okay, these are the two data nodes that you want to read from. And then, the client itself directly does the reading. The reading happens in parallel. So, I have, I'm reading the data node uh, they reading a block B and reading block A and all of this reading happens and the red data is transferred to the client back. So the reading here is happening in parallel. So the entire HDFS works on the fundamental principle of write once and read many times. Why write once? First of all, because the write is a little complex. It has a lot of network latent network traffic. It has a lot of metadata operations included, um, and we are writing multiple copies. So it's a little tedious process, and we write it only once. And but we read it multiple times. Reading happens in parallel, so it's much faster than read, and that's why 
we say that Hadoop is write once and read many times architecture. Okay, any questions till now? No questions? So do we want me to go ahead? Just give me a quick hands up so that I can move ahead. Okay, perfect. So till now we have understood the first component in Hadoop, which is the HDFS, which, can, which takes care of the storage. Now we take we see the second component, which is YAN, which is actually the processing component. The YAN, YAN is basically a resource manager, which takes care of resource allocation and actually running the processing tasks. And how do the processing happen? It happens via MapReduce. And what is MapReduce? As the name says, it has two components, the Map and the Reduce. So all your entire processing happens in two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. So as you can understand by the name itself, map is basically reading these different blocks and doing activities individually on these different blocks. So now we have split the data. We have certain blocks. Let's say we have, for this particular input file, I have three blocks. Then I will have three map tasks running in three on these three blocks. Then after all these maps have finished and they have done the processing, I would want to do some reduce and some on these tasks and aggregate the results and then push the final results as an output. So you split the data, do the processing in parallel, aggregate the results. If you have any processing that you want to do on the aggregated results, you can do it or else and then you dump the data to the, as an output. So entire task is divided into a map phase and a reduced phase. Okay, so let's see a simple example. I think this will help us understand it better. So let's assume I have this one file and just for the purpose of simplicity, let's assume that you have these three different blocks of these files. Okay, and each map would want to run on one of the split right in parallel so the here what i want to do is the ultimate objective of mine is i want to read this file process this file and find out the word count simple word count what what do i need to do in a word count i need to count the occurrence of each word for example deer occurs two times car occurs three times beer occurs two times so i want to just calculate the final result which is like this so how it will happen as i was saying this is my input these are the splits these are the small splits of this input just for the sake of simplicity each map will work on this split okay the data acts as my value here and the offset or when i have some key which denotes this particular split so let's say this is one comma this, two comma this, three comma this. This entire activity is to understand and read this data. I read this data and I map this data. And what do I do in mapping? For each of the split, I divide this value and produce three results. That is for each word, I'm just emitting a value of one. So the value. So each word becomes my key and I'm emitting one for each value. Similarly, I do it for each of these three splits. Now, once this entire process is done, I would shuffle this data. And what do I mean by shuffling? I just collect the values associated with a particular key. So I will have all the values associated with beer at one place, car and deer and river, etc. at one place. Once I've done that, I would really want to calculate the total of the occurrence of this word. So since for every occurrence, I just emit one as a value, if I just add it together, I will get the final total. So when I do it, I get beer 2, car 3, and like that. And this becomes my final result. The key point to notice, this task, Reduction can only only happen when the entire mapper, all the mappers, even if I, hundred, I have 100, 1000, 10,000 mappers, all the mappers have successfully finished their tasks. Till that point, I cannot start the reduction.
because it's pretty possible that my 100th mapper which is still running might have some value for a particular key. So a reducer will only start once the entire mapper is finished. And what you have to worry about is writing what you want in a mapper. Your application needs to write what you want in the reducer. The rest is taken care of by your framework. How the split will happen, how the shuffle will happen, how the results will be interpreted, everything will be taken care of by the framework. And the beauty is, if I want the default behavior of splitting to change, if I don't want to process each record individually, if I want to process the entire file, if I want to shuffle it in a different way, every step I can customize if I want. But if I don't want to add complexity if my application is fairly simple and I only want my upper end reducer, I don't want to worry about the implementation of the different phases which can be taken care of by the uh, framework itself. Okay, so if you want to change the splitting that you don't want to split it line by line, you want to split it every three lines or you want to split it by certain character, anything you can change. It's all customizable. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's move ahead to the second component, which is YARN. So MapReduce is a processing engine, but it is managed by a component called YARN. YAN is yet another resource negotiator. So it manages the resources of your system. So we have two nodes, data node and name node. The name node is our metadata, contains the metadata and the master. And the data node is the slave and it contains the actual data. Similarly, YAN also has two components, the resource manager and the node manager. The resource manager is a process which is the master process and the node manager is a process which runs on each data node and is the slave process. So resource manager takes care of the overall resources of the entire cluster. It manages the allocation of those resources and uh, triggering alarms, etc, etc. The name node manager manages and monitors the resources on that particular data node. Now, apart from these two, we have also two different components which do not exist, which only come into picture when you trigger a processing operation or when you start a MapReduce job. So these are called the container and the application master. So whenever you start an application, whenever you start a process, a new container or a new process called application master is started which is specific to that particular application and this application master works very closely with the resource manager to get the resources for the allocated data nodes and coordination of these different processes. All that is done by the application master. And when you want to actually run something, when you want to run a map task or you want to run a reduce task, a new container is launched. What is a container? A container is just a simple small JVM unit. Uh, it is a simple um, space with a specified memory and CPU power that is run on the top of your data node. And in this allocated space only, an actual process is run. So what, so let me move forward and uh, let you know how a map reviews works and you'll be able to understand these components. Okay, see this. So what is happening here is, you have a map reduce code that you want to run okay and this is your client so you submit your job to your resource manager right because the resource manager is a master the resource manager will start a container it will choose any node and it will start a container and what i said is a container it's just an allocated amount of space and ram and cpu that that is allocated for a certain process to run and it will allocate, start a container in any of the node manager, in that container an application master, specific to that particular application, specific to this particular MR job will be started. This application master will then contact the resource manager and tell it, okay, I want to run one map and one reduce. So you give me resources, uh, you give me which data nodes I want to run on and you get, tell me what, what will be the um, capacities of these containers I need to launch and I will do that. 
and that the uh, resource manager tells the application master with all these details and allocates resources. Once that is done, based on the resources that it has got, it starts the container on that specific data node. This, this is my container, and inside this container, an actual task is run and executed. And once that is done, my application master exits and it finishes and if the lifetime of my application master is done. So the lifetime of your application master and your containers is only till the life of your process. Once the process is done, they, these processes finish and exit. Only the node manager and the resource manager are occur for the entire lifetime of your Hadoop cluster. So again, just a recapitulation, what is happening? The client is submitting an application to the resource manager. The resource manager is allocating a container to start the application master. Once the application master is done, it registers with the replicate, uh, resource manager and it asks the resource manager to give it containers or to allocate resources. Once that is done, application master for that particular data node, it contacts the node, name node manager to, for that particular data node to launch the required containers. Once that is done, tasks are executed inside that container and the client obviously at regular interval of times can contact the resource manager and the application manager master to get the status. And once the task is finished, the application master and registers with the RM resource manager and it exits. Okay, so we have explored how we write data, how we read data, how we run applications, what is MapReduce. Any questions till now? No questions? Are we good to go ahead? Do you have no questions? So should I assume that you're fairly well understood what is MapReduce and what is HDFS? Or is it that it's um, nothing is understood? At least give me something, people. A yes, no. Okay, people are saying I'm clear. I'm pretty happy that I'm that you are able to understand. Okay, so this is just an overview. This was just an overview of the two major components that we have in Haroop. One is for storage and one is for processing. But Haroop, as I told you, it's a platform. Okay, and as a platform, it's, it comprises of an ecosystem. So if you see here, I'm very briefly, I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of the various components that we have in the Hadoop ecosystem. So we already discussed, we have HDFS and we have YAN. This is the basic component. Other than that, nothing can run if we do not have these two. Okay, now, when Obviously, you have Hadoop as a file system, so you would want to put the data into Hadoop and move the data out of Hadoop, right? So let's say if you want to put, the, you have data in some databases and you want to move that data into Hadoop, you would use some uh, system, a system like Scoop, which will connect to your RDBMS and put the data into Hadoop. And also, it can move the data from HDFS to your RDBMS or or any structured data format. Similar to that, if I have unstructured data, if I have RSS feeds, if I have tweet, tweets, if I have streaming information, if I have web log information that is continuously streaming, structured or unstructured, semi-structured or unstructured data, I would use system like Loom to put that data into my HDFS. Now I have my data, I have my YARN system ready, so I would definitely want to do something on that data. So, PID is one system wherein you can do scripting or you can write scripts to analyze or do processing on their data. Then you have Hive and Drill, which are SQL-like systems which run on top of Hadoop. So they expose, like PID exposes scripting framework, Hive exposes a SQL-like language, and you, people who have been using SQL a lot can easily gel in with Hive and they can use Hive to run the data. I will pick up and show you quickly what is Hive after this slide. 
Then you have the core processing. You can write your action logic in MapReduce, which has the major library in which MapReduce is supported is Java, but it also has streaming libraries for a lot of other languages like Python and Shell and Perl. Then you would want Haroop also exposes a NoSQL database which uses HDFS as the background storage engine, and that is called as HBase. So you can do all your queries in HBase. It is a columnar database that you can use for your needs. Then you have Spark, and I think many of us are aware of what is Spark. It is an in-memory processing engine. We have Kafka and Storm. We have Mahat and Spark MLlib for machine learning. We have Solar and Lucene for indexing. And we have Uzi for scheduling. So all of these engines, right, all of these engines that we've been talking about, all of these components of the Hadoop ecosystem are work on the same manner. They expose a framework to you, and you can write a script, you can write a SQLite query, you can write a Java code for AppReduce, you can write an edge-based query, whatever you do. Internally, it will be translated by the framework into a MapReduce code and that MapReduce code will be run by YARN and it will use the data which is there in HDFS. So these two form the basic platform. And then you can have any of these different frameworks in the ecosystem as per your needs. Okay, so for example, if you have a data warehousing need, which, um, which, which was there in the case of orbits that we discovered, that we saw some time back. So there, Hive was the most suited use case. Hive is like a data warehouse that for the Hadoop ecosystem. So it can help you do SQL queries and you don't have to, you know, have such a learning curve. So uh, Randir is asking, can we have Big and Hive uh, in the same project? Yes, obviously you can. You can, ha you can have as many technologies as you want as per your needs in the same project. There's no stopping you that you cannot have Big and you cannot have Hive working together. You can have, actually, in my experience, what I have done lately in my projects is we've had MapReduce, we've had Big, we have had Hive, and as the aggregated engine, we have used HBase, plus we have used indexing engine. And for the purpose of getting the data, we have used Code Blue. So these six, seven components we have used together as one solution many a times. Okay? So, it really doesn't matter how many technologies, it only matters that the solution should be best fit and the solution should suffice your needs. Okay? So let's move on and see the case study that I've been talking about. It's the same case study, the orbits worldwide. If you remember, I just told you that in this problem statement, orbits is an e-commerce platform and they provide a platform for searching for flights and hotels. And every day they were getting millions of hits, millions of searches for hotels and flights. And this was like accumulating gigabytes, 500 gigabytes of data in their system. Now the problem was in this warehouse, they, they wanted obviously to create a warehouse because you have log data, you want to cleanse that data, you want to create a structure out of that data, you want to put that data into some system and then you want to create reports out of it. So when you were doing that, when you were creating a warehouse for uh, segregating or collecting this information from different systems and putting them together, looking at the volume and the velocity of this data, the traditional RDBMS system and the traditional way of processing, the traditional DFS was not able to solve it. So they decided to move ahead and cut their expenses by unnecessarily buying very, very heavy hardware infrastructure which would obviously not scale after a certain amount of time and would move back to the solution and use Hadoop as their solution. So what was their requirement? They wanted something which is efficient in long term. They wanted some analytical tool which can utilize the entire data set in one go and give them cost-effective solutions rather than utilizing only part of the data and something which is cost-effective. And you know what? Hadoop solves all these problems. It can store data, long-term storage, huge data sets, no problem. It can process huge data sets. You can scale as per your need. Um, it is uh, scales horizontally, so it doesn't have a problem of being very, uh, anyways, it's an open source tool, so 
it doesn't have a cost associated with itself and when you are just buying hardware this is commodity hardware scaling out is a cost effective solution then it comes with various analytical tools it's like hive so you can have hive you can have hbase and then you can create reports on top of it so it is a very efficient solution and they could use it very well okay so as i told you i would show you what is hive so i will show you in the context of orbits itself so we know MapReduce does all the processing in HDFS and but many of us have been working with SQL a lot in our careers. So it's very difficult to all of a sudden move out of SQL and start working with MapReduce, start writing Java codes. Many of us might not even know Java. So the learning curve is too high. So what Hadoop came forward with, it came with a solution wherein it said, okay, you can use a SQL-like query language. So it exposed a SQL-like query language. All of these queries are internally by the framework translated into a MapReduce code. And these MapReduce code run on HDFS. Okay, so this SQL plus MapReduce is called Hive Query Language or HQL. Okay, and you can do, for example, you can write queries like this, select name star something something, which is very similar to what you are writing in uh, your SQL language. And then you run it on Hive, internally it is translated into a MapReduce, which runs on HDFS and gives you an output. So what I'm going to do now is, I am going to give you a tour of the steps that Orbit's followed, and then I'm going to take you to the actual demo that we wanted to cover. Okay, so as I said, this is what Orbits wanted to do. It decided that writing MapReduce is going to be very time taking and it's going to involve a lot of learning curve. So why not use Hive? So what they did is they used Hive for their system. They had large amounts of data and they were storing that data of different types. They had log files, they had RDBMS data, they had some other information like uh, comments of people, some textual data, text files, different types of data. So Hadoop can store all of the data. So they decided they'll dump all that data into HDFS. But their data needed a lot of cleansing because it was not clear. When you're talking about log data, right? Your log data can be just text. So you need to extract information out of it so as to be able to process it. So they decided, okay, just to do the first level of cleansing or for a uh, few steps, we can do the first basic cleansing in MapReduce and not write the complex queries there. So do the cleansing in MapReduce, process it, put the output stuck data somewhere, and then on that data, you run uh, your Hive languages and um, you expose, uh, you build a report which uses Hive query language and which uses HDFS data and it gives you all the results. So let's say you want to analyze a hotel position, okay, in search bar using, so you have a lot of log data, and, uh, and that log data has a lot of information about some session, some, some visitor typing in, rating some hotel. So based on the ratings, the hotel has some position or it has some kind of rate associated with it. So you want to just write a query and you want to add, convert that query into your edge, uh, into your MapReduce. So all that uh, thing will be done by Hive. Okay. So we have some source which can be your search, uh, your application, and then you have the log, log data coming in, and you put that log data into your Hadoop cluster. You do MapReduce to just do the cleaning process. Then you put that data into Hive. Uh, the analyst can use this Hive query to analyze the data. Not only it helps you build reports, but it helps you figure out probable problems that you might be having in your data. Because sometimes what would have happened, let's say for example, uh, what Orbitz figured out was, though the rating of a particular hotel was high, but still its position was lower. That means there was something wrong which was happening by the way the uh, rating was being uh, created or the position was being calculated based on the rating, or there was some factors that they were missing, like they were not taking care, they, they were the weightage that had been given to a positive comment, or uh, along with the rating that a person gave was not accurate. 
So those weightages and those algorithms needs to be adjusted. So this kind of analysis was very important so as to give the best pseudo results. So let's assume I, I'm typing in something. I want to do a book and hotel, but I want to I want to book a five star hotel. Okay, so I say that the rate is five star, and I want to book a five star hotel, some hotel which is five stars. Now, when I do that, and I figure out that the rating of a three star hotel is high, the position of a three star hotel is higher in my system than a five star hotel, then there's something really wrong with it. I would not actually rely on their website, rely on their rating algorithms, or rely on orbits. I would go to some other website and get, get some do bookings there. So to, to get more accurate results, it's very important to analyze and understand the data. And when your data is in HDFS, you would not want to every time write Mac MapReduce to do this simple analysis. You would want something which can do this very, very fast. And that is what Hive tells you. Hive enables you to just write random queries like you do in SQL and understand the data and find out these possible flows and do quick analysis, out of analysis on this data. Okay, so let me just quickly let you know about the example that we are doing today. So what we'll be doing is we have got two kind of logs. We are using the similar case study like orbits. We have just created uh, our own, um, uh, what do you say, data in the similar fashion. So we have created two types of data, two types of logs. One is the impression list. So the impression list contains the ranking of each hotel in the search bar. So whenever you uh, search for something along with your session ID, that entire session ID hotel and the ranking is saved as a part of your, uh, so as, as a part of your uh, impression list. And then we have the second kind of log wherein it has the actual uh, people who booked for it. So one log contains just searching people who searched for it and the rating for that. And the one log contained people who actually booked the hotel. So now what we want to figure out, we want to find out the average rating of a hotel. And to find out, we have to do a lot of computation. First, we have to clean that data because as you see here, this data contains a lot of this information and many of this information is not important to us or I might need to apply some cleaning logic, some ETL process to clean the data. So we will first clean the data. Once I've done that, I would want to get only those uh, ratings or rankings for the people who have booked the hotel, not the people who have just visited the website and ranked it. So I would want to extract only those sessions based on my sessions IDs. Only the people who have booked the hotel, I would extract the ratings for them. And once I've done that, I would do certain queries and analyze the data. Okay? So have you understood the use case? Can I go on to the demo? Give me a quick hands up. Um, if you have any kind of questions till now, if we can go on to the demo. Okay. So this is, uh, let's go to the demo. So what I've done is just um, for the purpose of this particular webinar, I have already set my system running and I have few processes which are running on my system. So let me show you, first of all, all these 30 processes on this particular node. I have a pseudo distributed environment which we say like one node and it has all the Hadoop processes running. That node is the master and that same node is a, a slave as well. So if I do this, if you see here, what do I have? I have a node manager. I have a resource manager. I have a name node and I have a data node. So I have all these four important processes running on my machine. So my HDFS is full set up. And HDFS provides you a capability to access your file system, that is the HDFS file system, using similar shell-like commands that you're very familiar with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what does my HDFS directory contain by using the ls command. So just for the purpose of this training, let us create a directory. I will create a directory called webinar uh, using my mkdir option. So I will say open 
Okay, so I'm done. Now what I'm going to do is, I have these two files which I just talk about, talked about. The impression list, which contains the rating in the search bar, and then web trend, which contains the actual booking information associated with that session. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to move these files into HDFS so that I can start working with them. And what command am I going to use? I'm going to use the put command, Hadoop. Put, and we can choose this, impression list. So I'm going to put in the same directory that we just created. And if you see, right, the process of writing data or into HDFS, it's so simple. I don't have to worry about which nodes. I don't have to worry about which, uh, how, where the metadata, where to store it, where to do it. It's pretty simple. I can just do it by writing a simple command. And all those administrative tasks are taken care of by the framework itself. Okay? So I have put all that there. Now, as I told you, we will do a cleansing activity. So for the cleansing activity, just for the purpose of this demo, we have created two jar files. These are just two simple MapReduce Java programs. And what we have in these Java programs is just very simple activity wherein I am, uh, let's say, uh, I, I have uh, tens of thirties of columns in my uh, actual log. So we are removing all these unnecessary columns and we are cleaning up the data and we are only extracting the columns which are needed by us. So just for the purpose of this particular webinar, we have kept it very simple. So the cleaning activity here involves just extracting the required columns and we will get that. So now what I'll do is I have written the map reduce here to clean the impression file and to clean the web trend file. I'm just going to simply run that code and I will give the name of the class which contains all that. So you don't have to worry about the syntax as of now when you start writing and working with it, you will fairly well understand the syntax. The idea is just to show you the flow of data between these systems. Then I will give an input. So this is my input and I have created a direct, I have given the name of underscore out as the output directory. Let's just run it. So if you see, it understands, okay, how many splits it wants, and it submits the application to the resource manager, and then the resource manager will be allocating a container, it will be launching the application master, and then the map and reduce will run. Okay, so then my reduce is done, and let's, let's just quickly see what is there in my directory. So if you see here, the file with, by the name part M has gotten created. If I can show you the content of that file, if you want. So I am, for the purpose of the demo, I'm just using uh, the shell prompt, uh, I mean the shell. You, we also have a web interface for the same. And maybe if I have time, I'll show you that. Okay, so one is done. We have cleaned the log um, impression cleaner. Uh, let's just clean the second file as well. So the cleaning activity is being done by the MapReduce phase. Once we are done with the cleaning, then we will actually dump this data into Hive and then we will do some high queries, we'll do a join, we'll do certain queries, and we, at the end, we will figure out the average position of a hotel, okay? So I am done, and we are ready with two data sets. So let's now move on to Hive, and let's see what we can do in Hive. So I'm connecting to the Hive shell, 
In Hive, there is a specified format to create the table. Uh, it's very similar to um, SQL format. Only thing is, you have to sometimes specify in which format does it need to read the file. So that's how you have, you have to specify certain things. So for example, I'm creating a table, create table, web trend. And as for the cleaning of the my data, I will specify certain columns. I will have session ID, which is string. Then visitor ID. See, this if you see here really closely, it's pretty similar to your SQL format. So this is the table creation syntax. Along with it, I have to specify row format, information about the file from which I will be loading data inside it. So I will say that the data has a row, the file has a row format and it has delimited fields. So this syntax terminated by comma. This syntax is pretty specific to Hive. So so it has created the table. Now let me create the second table, the impression table for dumping the impression data. It has session ID. Mm, sorry. Okay, the table already exists. I'm going to give it a different name. Impressions. Okay. Okay. Then the tables are created. So I have to first dump the data in the tables because the tables are empty, right? So what I will do is I will load the data. We have a syntax for it which says load data input path in path and the name of that file which contains. So we created the cleanse data inside this folder, right? And it had some file called path star something m for five times zero into table web trend. So it's done, and if you see the total number of files, so let me do a quick count. Select from that trend and see if the data is down. Now, if you see, when I've done a query internally, it has launched a MapReduce job. And if you see, the query is like, you know, same as we write in SQL query. Select star, select statements, you have one limit and skip, and all those operations, like operations that are supported, we have all those operations supported. So we have 1,000 rows. Now let's load the second data. Load data. In Okay, so the data is loaded. Any questions till now? No questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is, as I told you, one of these uh, impressions contain the searches in the search bar, whereas web trends contain the information of uh, the people who actually made the booking. I only want to understand the rating based on the people who have actually made the booking. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. A person is not booked but is rated, so there's no sense as in the rating would not hold any credibility. So what I would do is I would join the two and get only that information, only those, in, those um, information wherein people who have actually booked the hotel. So I am going to join these two on the basis of session ID. 
Now, and what I'll do is I will save this information in another table. So let's create a table, a set thought table, create table called position. And it has session ID, of course, because that's the pin I'm going to join on. And I have hotel ID and I have position. Okay. Wait. Okay, so I have not. Session ID is string, hotel ID is string, and then I have position. So here if you see, I have not mentioned the additional syntax because I'm not going to load data from any file here. I'm going to join the data and then dump the data here. So what I'm going to do is insert into table position. And what am I going to insert? Select. A dot session ID, A dot hotel ID, and B dot position from web trend A join impressions B on what field? A dot session ID equals to b dot session id so i'm joining the two tables on session id and dumping the join data and the positions in wait it says invalid column in reference Okay, so let's see something inside this. Let's select star from position. Let's see what this data contains. Limit. So this is the session ID. Then I have a hotel ID and the position. Okay, so, so what happens is uh, for a particular hotel, obviously I would have more than one Rating. This position is basically the rating. So what we would want our interested to know is the average rating of a particular hotel. So we can, uh, if you want to do more processing, we can, you know, maybe if you have more than one, more, more data, you can do other join and you can do a lot of processing activities, create more tables and do that. For the purpose of this webinar, let's just do a very simple query and find out the average position. Uh, let me find out the column names first. Okay, so what I'm going to do is for each session, I, for each hotel, and we are going to just first get the average position, okay, and the total number of people who have are rated for it. So, select. An average of position group by mm, as rating So what I'm doing is I'm just calculating the total number of ratings that a hotel has been given and the average rating of that hotel and I'm sorting it by the rating. So the highest rated hotels will be at the top and I'm just sorting it. So in this manner when you have this data inside your HDH Hive, all these analysis that you can do, you can do on your Hive tables. Even you can create BI reports which work on the data which is residing on this Hive table. So this is the data that we have here. I think it is sorted in the descending order. So yeah, that's the default. Ascending order, that's the default. So if you see here, I've got 22 ratings for this particular hotel and the average is 6.3.
So this is just like a very, very, very simple example to see what hydrohydrogen halogenol can do. You, it has much more power and much more capacity than you can think of. Almost every problem, every problem that you see in your life related to analysis and processing of you know, this amount of data can be done using Hive and HDFS. I believe uh, somebody uh, asked me about a difference about between Splunk and uh, Hadoop, right? So uh, just just one liner, I would say that Splunk is a system which helps us analyze uh, streaming data. It is a little different from HDFS. It does not have the same uh, platform of MapReduce and the same platform that we see uh, in Hadoop. It's a little different. It majorly works on analyzing click stream data or web log data. Uh, that's the speciality of Splunk. And though it provides us also some certain capabilities like cloud services and you know um, analyzing all that data and creating quick insights. But Hadoop overall, it's a bigger ecosystem. Apart from just analyzing the data, it has a lot of other powers. Like it has indexing engine, it has machine learning libraries, it has um, um, scheduling libraries, it has a lot more power than Splunk. Splunk is just like a very, um, I can say Splunk, you can compare Splunk from, with um, Hive plus uh, Flume. So you get the data using Flume and dump it into HDFS and use Hive and then you can compare it with Splunk. So Bob is saying to get a job ASAP, what all components should be studied? So if you really want to get a job into Hadoop, uh, the best thing would be to get into, to understand overall Hadoop, uh, just to understand how it works and how it is different. And the best word in the market is to understand how Hive works. Hive and Pig are very important things that are being used lately a lot in the technology industry. But that all depends on the experience background you have. If you have a lot of SQL background, you should go and start quickly. Uh, you should start working on Hive and understand it, do some warehousing, um, you know, dummy projects in the system and learn about it, something like that. Sebastian says, how can I learn Hadoop? I mean, can you suggest me a few ways to get off the mark very quickly? So learning Hadoop is like, uh, to just get started with learning Hadoop, you can, um, you can read books. Well, there are a lot of books about Hadoop in the market, which are really good. You can get, you can, um, what do you say? You can um, uh, get in touch with the people. You can start practicing it on the system. You can get enrolled in some courses if you want. So the point is practice, practice, and practice. That's that's how you will learn Hadoop a lot. So Bob says, uh, I mean a job in the U.S., any suggestions on doing some real-life projects? So you have a lot of data available online, open source public data, like you have NASA data, you have a lot of other data, so you can figure out some, some um, calculations and analysis that might be intriguing to you. And there also, you have a lot of case studies which are available online, you can find them out and get the data and then uh, you can start working and solving those case studies using uh, your systems uh, rather than the traditional technology. Any other questions, please? Yeah, just one more thing I would like to highlight here and mention is about Spark. Um, I think somebody's asked me which all technologies should we work to get the job. So Hive, uh, as I said, is one of them. Then Spark is another one of them, which is very good when you, um, you know, these days because it gives you a lot of power and capacity. So this is also a buzzword these days. So you can start learning once you've got hold on Hive. Then you can work on something like Spark Hive integration so that you get learn, you can learn both of them. Uh, any one-to-one -one training on real life projects available anywhere? So Bob, I'm not pretty sure about a one-to-one -one training on a real life projects, but yes, um, uh, as far as um, uh, my experience goes and what I know, Edumaker definitely does provide some trainings and they provide a lot of training wherein they also give you a lot of assignments and real life projects that you can work on. So if you are interested, you can get enrolled, but that's completely your choice. And you can check with those people. Actually, I'm not the right person to do that. You can check with the salespeople and the support people at the Edureka team. And they can give you more information. They can, uh, you can get the training in your manner. You want some real life projects, you can get that. 
So all those things you can get in touch with the sales team. Uh, sales at the rate edureka.co. That's the uh, email address. Venkat says, what is the difference between cloud era and plain Hadoop? Okay, so there is actually um, not much of a difference, I would say. Plain Hadoop is just Apache and Manila version of Hadoop. So it's uh, the open source version of Hadoop. Cloud Era is a distributor of Hadoop who not only uh, they provide a platform uh, wherein they provide additional services on top of Hadoop, as in hosting services, uh, support services, um, provisioning services when you are working with a, a platform. So you have many, many such uh, platforms and many such uh, distributors. You have Cloud Era, you have Hortonworks, you have MapR. All of these provide you a lot of additional uh, support related services as in how to host it, how to run with it, how if, you, if you're stuck somewhere, how to get support. So they, apart from their basic uh, open source model, they have a commercial model, enterprise model, which provides you all of the services. So Sebastian says, can I join the training while working? Of course you can, because the training takes care, is like some trainings on the weekend, some on the weekdays, and they're like two to three hours a day. So they would definitely um, do those trainings while you are actually working on in your company or wherever. So the timings uh, are normally uh, based on in, in your late night or your early morning based on uh, um, the time zone that you have. So I think it should, it, either you can check with the sales people and you can check with the Edureka folks of what are the current trainings going on. And you can also mention about the timings that if you explicitly want some specific timings and if that can be arranged, you can obviously ask them. Any other questions do we have? Okay, people, if we do not have any questions, then I would say thanks a lot for joining and being patient and listening to the uh, current webinar on what is a loop and why a loop and all that. And thanks a lot once again. This is Anaya signing off. Thank you and have a happy day. Bye. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!